Okay. Hey, welcome to You Talking with Greg. Uh, I'm here with Rob Coble. Um, and Rob is the founder of one of my favorite sort of podcast series, uh, Conscious Evolution. Uh, my good friend Greg Thomas pointed me to that. Um, he knows the work that I'm doing in the space. Uh, I got involved in that, uh, digested all the, I think it was six episodes in the Consolidated Conscious Evolution. Thought that was an unbelievably uh, well executed thing, have sp stimulated lots of thoughts. Um, and I was like, hey, I want to talk to that guy and, and learn about it. Rob, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you, Greg. It's really nice to hear that, you know, because I see these sort of, um, you know, stats ticking away on my um, podcast host saying someone's listening to it. But I very rarely get to speak to them. So it's really nice to know. Um, well, I was definitely one of those guys that was tearing through it. Uh, and so it made me really curious about uh, your story and about sort of how you got into that, uh, the production of it, what you felt the response was, where you are. So uh, that's where I'd like to maybe begin is so you can sort of dive in and tell me how you got to the point where Conscious Evolution was uh, the big project you were working on. Sure. Um, well, it really began aged 21. Uh, okay. when I had a sort of massive spiritual awakening, uh, kind of nowhere, or it seemed to come out of nowhere for me anyway. And um, I, before that, had not really thought about spirituality or what my meaning and purpose was in life or any of those questions. Right. Sort of sleepwalking into a career in finance or something incredibly yeah. boring. I don't know. I, I, I'd hardly thought about it. And after that point, the felt sense that I was part of the universe and the universe was part of me um, suddenly made it very clear and obvious that my life had to be one of service to one degree mm. or another. Mm. And so I spent ages, first of all, wondering why the hell anyone didn't tell me that this kind of experience was possible. Um, and then mm. I spent a lot of time thoroughly confused about mm. the nature of reality and, and therefore if all this stuff was possible that people didn't talk about you know i suddenly had these like i was much more sensitive i could feel other people's emotions for the first time i suddenly just became up much much more aware and sensitive um sort of um person right. and that also brought it, it led me to question literally everything so i was mm -hmm. questioning the fundamental nature of reality and who i was and basically left me very confused and quite anxious Mm. And it wasn't until I found online John Stewart's Evolutionary Manifesto uh. that these ideas clicked into place, that I suddenly realized that there was a way of looking at the world that was consistent with my kind of secular upbringing mm -hmm. and that could also account for this powerful new felt sense that I was a spiritual being on a spiritual journey and that there was something, you know, that there was, there was some meaning to all of this. Right. And... Another can, huge can I just influence. pause you on that for a second? Because I think this is really, um, to me, what you're speaking to is really, it's really a fractal of what I hope happens, basically. And what I mean by that is that I believe, certainly from my vantage point, the way modernity or whatever we want to call it, construed our place and what the universe is and our place in it um, is, is missing a tremendous uh, component of what is real. Uh, and it seems to me that your consciousness tapped into that in a particular kind of way. And you felt that in the embodied sense of being the way you saw the world, the way you related to people. And it was like, and your comment, like, why the hell did anybody tell me about this? I mean, I think it's just a beautiful, you know, snapshot that I that certainly I'm trying to uh, articulate for people to at least have an inkling uh, that there's an awakening here. That's, uh, that's really possible. So thanks for that. That's a really powerful just as uh, articulation of this uh sort of the dynamic that i am seeing yeah and it's and it's so sad in a way that, that the sort of modern scientific secular way of looking at things has well up till now has done such a very good job of sort of stripping away all of that um yeah, sub sub the subjectivity the sort of um, development of consciousness the spiritual potentials that we have within us um and also the kind of all the meaning you know, really, all the meaning and purpose, the, the, the idea that, that life is just bobbling along meaninglessly like some sort of random walk and evolution isn't going somewhere. You know, these are, th that leaves people with a really stark choice between basically um, buying into that particular worldview 
or buying into a religious spiritual worldview and therefore being inherently suspicious of everything scientific. Yep. And that's a horrible false choice to force people into and yep. turns out um, completely um, just founded on a kind of false metaphysics, basically. It's just not, it's just a false choice. Can't agree further with that. <laughs> that's what we're, we're trying to uh, really kind of leverage an evolution into and so actually you talk um you know is grounded in the science of psychology and basically finds that in that context there are lots of different john stewart finds it in a different way lots of different people are finding that in various places in the modern worldview but that's a where where i come from is science of psychology and psychotherapy but um, it's just really striking and i am hopeful that the zeitgeist is beginning to shift so that we can wake up out of uh, what we've been missing here and I don't know about you, but it does seem to me that the sort of nexus point that all of these different ways of coming at this conclusion um, have all stumbled upon is this sort of evolutionary worldview, right? Oh. This developmental way of looking at not just individual development, but collective development, the evolution of the whole process from the Big Bang to the present moment. Like that way of looking at things seems to be the point at which this sort of scientific or spiritual way of perceiving connect. Totally. hundred percent. I think that the running cosmic evolution uh, is a running line through all of that. You know, uh, the, there's an, it, there's a recognition that from many different facets, there's a recognition of this sort of cosmic evolution. Uh, I think the way you frame it in terms of conscious evolution is a uniquely um, that's people are dawning on that facet of it, but at the big picture, big history level. And I, I'm a follower of big history. Dave Christian's work in that got a lot of attention within you know, the system as a whole, uh, in terms of maybe not like the big picture, like really influencing the Academy, but a lot of people really saw that kind of articulation and were drawn to it. Uh, and I think all of the threads, uh, would agree that this sort of time by complexification, big picture view that then places us in a fundamentally different metaphysical relation, certainly than any mechanistic reductive physicalism. Um, there is a real, real shared uh, sentiment along those lines, 100%. Mm. I've done a lot of that um, kind of big history uh, with, with school kids, but also now with adults as well, sort of um, almost on, like, on a consulting basis to help um, companies work out their meaning and purpose. But that, we do sort of evolutionary timeline exercise. And, you know, it's, first of all, it's the people's reactions are always strong and often in different directions. Some people you know, suddenly look at the whole thing and go, God, we're so insignificant and nothing we do matters. And other people feel this tremendous responsibility to the, to the rest of the process that, you know, that actually we're in this uniquely incredible position. Um, but certainly the, the sort of amazing thing that, pe that, that the penny that drops for people is that this isn't something that I'm just spectating from afar. This is me. All these levels of evolution are part of me, that I am it. I'm living it now. I'm breathing it. I'm, I'm quite literally, with my very actions, pushing that 13.7 billion-year-old process one step forward. And how I do that, with what degree of consciousness and awareness I do that, is basically the difference for our species right now between the utopia or bust. All right. Boom. Wrap it up. There it is. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, I love that. Uh, I mean, and that's um, how we can cultivate the um, implications of what you just said there in, into people's souls uh, is what I see our, my, you know, at the core of our task here. I thought that was a, a wonderful and beautiful way of saying that. And it's good to see that as you contact with people and they, and they are, are given opportunities to engage and, I think that anybody that thinks existentially about the universe has to deal with some nihilistic insignificance. Oh my God, that thing, you know, and at the same time, a sense of continuity. Uh, certainly for me, I, I'll often say that the earth burns like a quasar of complexity in the night sky. Um, if you turn it from the lens of complexification, um, the, whole, the earth system is radically different than anywhere else that we know of in the universe, certainly all sorts of possibilities. Um, so that's one of the angles I take to then try to embrace the need to preserve, the need to connect the importance of our particular role in this stack layer of complexification. We are at a very unique um, place in the way in which uh, our little baton of energy information is organized. Um, and uh, there is actually a really unique and special 
uh, way of framing uh, our place in the cosmos, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's a, it's an interesting one that, you know, I had that conversation with John Viveki is like, to what extent, you know, I mean, because there, there seems to be this thrust of evolution, at least that we can spectate on earth. And yet, of course, it is taking place in this giant kind of void of nothingness. So, so sometimes it's just about how you slice the cake. You know, do you look at that as a kind of cosmic accident or, or you know, I, do you look at it the way I look at it, which is that there seems to be a clear direction to all of that complexity. And, and yeah, we, we, we just happen to be in the, in the position right now of suddenly for the first time in the history of life on earth with in the privileged position of being aware of that whole process. And that affords us a unique capability, much the same way as becoming aware of an individual pattern or habit of behavior gives you the chance to free yourself from it. So do you remember during the pandemic, they asked us, um, don't touch your face so much. And suddenly everyone was like, oh my God, I had no idea I was touching my face that much. <laughs> and it suddenly became really hard. But then it's the, the more you became aware of it, the more you were able to actually go, okay, I'm actually going to stop doing this thing. Right. Well, <clears throat> evolution too has its patterns and habits. And, and some of those patterns and habits are still conducive to the ongoing flourishing of life on earth. And some of them aren't. But until we become aware of them, until we become aware of our own evolution, then we're just going to be a slave to them. And we're going to play out unconsciously whatever sort of, um, you know, uh, maladaptive behaviors we've been saddled with by our evolutionary past. And, you know, some of these behaviors are quite literally leading us to extinction, you know, like the, the oh. impulse to hoard possessions or, or mm -hmm. gain status or, um, yeah, I, I eat fast food. I mean, that's not necessarily leading us to extinction. Well, I suppose it kind of is. Of course, the environmental problems for that are definitely, you know, causing problems. So it's like, until we can become really conscious of all this stuff, then we're just going to be buffeted around by our evolutionary past in ways that is ultimately unhelpful. Now, I, I have to preface all this by saying that um, I'm not a good example of my own theory. <laughs> so please don't think I don't like I'm not putting myself forward as a good example to follow. Um, I, I just I mean, I hope what I say is useful for people to work some of this stuff out and to think about themselves in a different way and to become good examples themselves. But I'm not I'm not it. I'm not the example. Um, so I feel I feel I have to leave yeah. with that. Well, well, I appreciate that. And I, I think that for me, um, the first, I, you know, I'm a psychotherapist, you know, I train people how to be psychological doctors. Okay. Uh, and in that context, one of the things I emphasize is a process of awareness, acceptance and change. Um, and so the first, so what you were saying is, yes, we are just part of an unfolding wave of causation until awareness makes us shifts our perspective in relation. And it is then through the shift in perspective that all of a sudden choice then presents itself when it was absent before. Um, and that when you become aware, people then often want to then jump into action. And I'm often like, well, um, you want to metabolize the perspective of awareness first, because now if you've shifted your awareness fundamentally, the causes, then we need to understand where we are in the unfolding of cause. Um, so for me, what I am, I think we are on the cusp of a conscious uh, awareness that is radically different. Um, I think, though, that where that is and what that means, exactly what we all need to be doing right now is totally ambiguous. Okay, I don't think that there's a clear articulation of, oh, so now this is now this is how we would have a sustainable global society that has digital technology, that has the current nation states, that has the belief value structures, that has the science, that has the way we relate to the environment. I mean, that complex dynamic of you know the invitation is, hey, can we evolve to that? Um, so right now, and the way we will do that is first through awareness and then acceptance of where we have been and the ways in which we are constrained by our past, causal past, and then the adaptive opportunities and the wise opportunities that we might be able to fundamentally realize in the next, in on my generation, my kids' generation, and the generation after them, because that's what kind of, that's the arc of time, certainly, that I feel like we're on. Yeah, and you're right. It absolutely just has to start with awareness. You know, first individual self-awareness, but then awareness as a, as a whole culture, as a whole civilization of, of the patterns that, you know, the civilizational patterns of history and, you know, how we can become aware of those as well and how we can design our civilizations in order to allow the trajectories of evolution to carry on rather than kind of basically collapsing um, right. as, as civilizations have done all throughout history. 
and you can really, I mean, you can talk about it in those two terms. How, how as individuals can we consciously evolve and, and, and be vehicles for evolution? And how as a culture and a civilization and kind of external side of things, how can we design for evolution to unfold? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I can talk about sort of either one of those a little bit. As you say, no one has all the answers, but um, I know some people who have some good starts. <laughs> totally. Yeah, no, absolutely. In fact, that's why uh, uh, I'm definitely curious about that. And maybe before we get into some of the specifics of individual and societal, um, just the whole, I was really super impressed by what you were able to pull together with the conscious uh, evolution series. Um, so I'm just kind of curious about how you manage that, uh, what afforded you that opportunity to connect with the people that you did and, and to generate that kind of production. Yeah, well, I... This evolutionary manifesto idea was basically burning inside me for years. Um, and, you know, it also came from Robert Persig, um, his second book. I actually read a little bit of it in preparation for this interview. Have you, have you read it? I've read, I haven't read it. I read it, loved his first one. Uh, I haven't read the in depth of his second, but I've been, uh, yes. Uh, it, it, uh, it's basically, I mean, it, it's the closest thing I've seen to your um, tree of knowledge, you know, with the, the four levels, the three levels. I mean, he splices it up slightly differently. He talks about physical, biological, um, social, and intellectual. But I mean, whatever, he's, he's getting at the same point. Um, and yeah, it, 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 he's saying, it, it, you're, I mean, you'll, you'll, you'll be nodding the whole way, but it's quite satisfying, isn't it, to find somewhere out there being like, yes, I told you. <laughs> um, but um, so he was a huge influence as well. And then, of course, Ken Wilber. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these ideas were kind of rolling around and I had no outlet for them. I had no way to get them across. And I discovered the hard way trying to convince someone in the pub several pints down um, <laughs> of like a massive evolutionary philosophy is mm. really difficult. Mm. Um, it is good training, however, um, because I did very quickly work out all the ways that you shouldn't explain it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and through that process, I got better and better at doing that. Um, and then, you know, I, I was just sort of looking for a platform, basically. I mean, it got okay. to the point where I would... Um, I remember just like giving random speeches in public in like really like inappropriate places because I just had to tell someone about this, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, which went more or, more or less well, these speeches, depending on uh, the location. <laughs> um, but in the end, I was like, okay, come on, I've got to take this seriously. And so um, the podcast just seemed like the right format. It's long form, so you don't, you don't have to rush. You can, um, you know, really delve into an idea and lay it out in the, in a particular order. Whereas when you're having a conversation, people ask questions, and so they end up going back to the beginning and towards the yep. end of the thing. Whereas if you can lay it all out in a particular order, you can almost take people on a journey and yep. then kind of hit them with the conclusion when they already have all the pieces in place to make sense of it. That's exactly how it comes together, and and that's a uh, um, so we'll certainly obviously put that in the show notes in case anybody hasn't seen it. I strongly recommend the Conscious uh, Evolution podcast. I was very um, impressed with how you did put it together. So, um, like you you obviously had some good contact with people, really impressive people, and you threaded it together really well. Um, so it's interesting you mentioned Wilbur. Uh, so his integral theory, and how you had some evolutionary psych, evolutionary complex complexification people, complex adaptive systems. You had a wide variety of different folks. So I'm kind of curious in your intellectual lineage, were you uh, being guided by anybody? You're just sort of self-taught on these issues. Um, how did you know who to pick? All of that kind of question comes to mind. Um, well, John Stewart definitely set me on the road. But like he, he uh, first showed me to Ken Wilbur and, you know, through Ken Wilbur, I, I, I can't remember how I found like the Future Thinkers podcast right. and then Daniel Schmachtenberger and, you know, all of these ideas kind of um, led into each other. But essentially, I just I think I was quite lucky to have not had like a really demanding full time job for a few mm -hmm. years after yeah. I left uni uh, when I was going through a lot of these transformations. I was also teaching bridge on the side, which was like mm -hmm. three days a week. Uh, but I had just like a lot of time to kill and basically sort of did my own master's course in mm -hmm. all of these topics mm -hmm. um, and writing articles about them as well. So I think, you know, that's how I found um, uh, Kelly Smith, for example, the sort of like um, complexity scientists at um, right. Clemson. And mm -hmm. yeah, so so that's how I found them. All. And, and in the end, you know, they were all very kind enough to give me their time 
um, you know, people like Carter Phipps, who, you know, gave me a sort of like two and a half hour interview mm. um, full of real gold dust. Um, right. And so, yeah, and then it was just a question of weaving it all together. Um, and I had, a, I should, I should give a shout out as well to my friend, Robbie McInnes, who mm-hmm. makes podcasts professionally and gave me a huge amount of um, time and mm-hmm. expertise to make it in a kind of high high right. audio quality way, like almost like a radio documentary, because mm-hmm. you can tell a real story with that. Yeah. Can you actually, so let's uh, dive in a little bit just to some of the parts that you really delineated. I really like the way you did, you but broke it up in a really nice way, but also threaded uh, the parts together and then hit at the end and created a, uh, what I thought was a really uh, nice picture. Okay, okay, let's walk through just a little bit of some of the key pieces that you uh, walk the listeners through in that. Structure. Sure. So the first episode is essentially just making the claim that doing what you find meaningful is incredibly important in life, that, that um, there's all this research that says you live longer, um, you're happier, you do better in work and school, you're more resilient. Um, important caveat, of course, that not everyone is free to go and pursue what they find most meaningful. That's actually quite a privilege to be in a you know economic and also psychological freedom to just like do what you really love. Um, but even people who have that privilege often don't take that choice because mm-hmm. our culture is very bad at pointing people to ask these questions. Mm-hmm. So then the question of the podcast series becomes why these, th- why, you know, what are the three the things that people find meaningful? Right. And basically I stumble across three sort of buckets, which is mm-hmm. tends to be quite cross cultural and there's a lot of consensus on. Mm-hmm. So one is um, being of service to other people mm-hmm. or um, cooperation, um, being part of something larger than yourself. People tend mm-hmm. to find that very meaningful. Mm-hmm. Um, the second bucket is, creativity so expressing Mm -hmm. that which is unique within yourself and bringing Mm -hmm. it out into the world and that can take place across any domain whether we're talking Mm -hmm. cooking art music science even coming up with a new theory to Mm -hmm. test is a creative process um even entrepreneurs Mm -hmm. um and then the third thing that we find deeply meaningful is transcendence and that can be a religious spiritual thing Mm -hmm. But it can also be about just self-improvement or somehow gaining capacities that you didn't have in the past. Development totally. as well. The way, you know, Hansi yep. Frein Act, if you want to think about those, so those four mm-hmm. lines of development that are all mm-hmm. transcending what you were before in right. some important way. Right. Um, so then the question becomes, why these three things and, and what do they have in common? And is there mm-hmm. anything which underpins them? Can we come up with like a kind of unified theory of what is meaningful? Mm-hmm. Um, and it turns out that these three things are excellent descriptors of the evolutionary trajectory yes that, um from a cloud of hydrogen gas through to rose bushes giraffes and humans and mm-hmm. um, the evolutionary process has continually been expanding its circles of cooperation mm-hmm. becoming better and better at evolving i.e becoming more and more creative yep. and continually breaking out of the constraints that each level of evolution has um, has held it within um, and to flourish into a, into a higher order of complexity with more emergent creativity and wider and wider scales of cooperation. Totally. And that ultimately, to take it to its ultimate conclusion, what is the most cooperative, um, the most creative, um, the most complex um, transcendent entity that you can imagine? And it's ultimately a very good definition of a god. Um, so, and, and that piece of the puzzle is totally optional, by the way. If you want to look at this in a secular way, the message still makes sense. The message is still, when you do what you find meaningful, you are participating in the evolutionary process. But for those who are of a spiritual nature, this is, I think, what we find meaningful is really our way of um, evolving towards God. The, the best of our purposes are, in some important sense, the best of the universe's purposes. Totally. Yeah. And they, uh, so this is, this is certainly the direction of the, uh, of you talk in terms of you know, how it, uh, interestingly enough evolves. Uh, so it evolves with the tree of knowledge. Uh, then it evolves into the garden and the tree of life, uh, and underneath the tree of life, uh, or the, the garden, uh, over the garden it resides what's called the elephant sun God. Uh, the elephant sun God is just the icon of the ultimate sort of negentropic goodness, meaning the opposite of chaotic entropy uh, that coordinates complexification uh, in a particular way. And then it, 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 at a naturalistic level, that turns into like what John Verveke might call the imaginal divine double and its ultimate source, which is basically then the projection of humanity and the creative process onto something's 
onto the things that are so obviously associated with um, coordination, complexification, transcendence, those kinds of issues, and then just mirroring back through the projection. That's the naturalistic. Uh, and then sort of the mystical into then, you know, or theistic version is then, no, that's an ontological force in relationship to the, that's pulling, guiding, uh, magnetizing the structure in a particular direction. Uh, so, mm -hmm. and both of those then, it's like, yep, you can sort of choose whether, you know, on what side of the, you know, your theistic interpretation of the world, but in relationship to that being um, either a man-made projective force or a genuine ontological force, we can really specify, uh, I argue, with a lot of clarity what that is, regardless of, of its, you know, ontological status. It certainly is an epistemological status that has all sorts of real-world implications. Mm, yeah, no, and that's exactly the the sort of strength of the worldview, right? Is that you can, I mean, you know, you said it um, much more articulately than I can, but that you can see where the whole thing is going and that you can play a part in that consciously, whether you think there's any ultimate purpose or, or whether there's any um, divinity guiding it all or whatever. It's right. still, there's still clearly trajectories in evolution. And through our choices as individuals and societies, we can either participate in those or turn our back on them. Simple as that, right? That doesn't require any supernatural entity. And by the way, um, John Stewart would say that, in fact, the evolutionary worldview supersedes the need for um, a god mm. or religion. <laughs> and so he would say that, you know, before we had um, a scientific worldview or an mm -hmm. evolutionary worldview, um, there were all sorts of, you know, religions basically evolved in order to provide guidance to sure. groups of people in order to make sure that they could coordinate and cooperate together and live harmoniously. You know, turn the other cheek or, um, you know, eye for an eye, even though those are game theoretical um, lessons. So, for example, um, yeah, I mean, that's a bit of a road I can go down. Let me know if you sure. want. Sure, yeah, no, please do it. In fact, we can, and then I'll riff off of that. So Utah's got its own version about what happens in relationship to this, and then we, they're going to be very complimentary. I know John was doing his work, but yeah, why don't we share that? Cool. So um, so in game theoretical simulations, game through, of course, classic yep. prisoner's dilemma situation, mm -hmm. cooperate or cheat, right? Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So in game theoretical simulations that they've done, uh, they did back in the 60s, this guy called mm -hmm. Robert Axelrod, yep. Um he basically did like a World Cup of game theory strategies. And all these game theorists came along and submitted their strategies and they all played against each other in a simulation. They saw which one won. And it turns out the one that won was tit for tat, which is basically eye for an eye, tooth for tooth. It's like, I'll cooperate first, yep. but then I will copy whatever you do on the previous move. So if you fuck me over, I'll fuck you over next move. Sorry, excuse right. my language. Um, but if you go back to cooperating, I'll go back to cooperating as well, okay? So um, in that sort of World Cup of game theoretical simulations, tit for tat was the winner. Um, and they went back for another round with the results published. And they said, OK, see if you can now beat tit for tat. And everyone came up with all sorts of these simulations. And they started introducing an element of um, basically inaccuracy. Because, of course, sometimes you intend to cooperate, but actually it gets misconstrued. You know, sometimes they, I, I don't pick up your message or I think you're lying to me, but you're actually not, yep. etc. So they introduced an element of variance. So occasionally um, signals would get miscommunicated. Mm -hmm. um, and what that means is that occasionally two tit for tats will get stuck in a cycle of mm. um, um, cheating against each other because there's been one miscommunication. It's quite hard to snap out of it. And so um, the only theory that came along which could beat that was turn the other cheek. I tit for tat, but with an occasional forgiveness. So I, if you cheat me, I'll, I'll forgive you a certain percentage of the time, but otherwise I'm tit for tat. And that turned out in a slightly messier sort of dynamic to be the winning strategy. And so what you see in that evolution is quite literally the evolution of human moral systems. Like these are good rules for life. These are good ways of being, these um, game theoretical mechanisms. And you know, the evolution of religion has kind of mirrored that evolution of like game theoretical systems. And essentially, you know, religions are a set of, um, did, no, I mean, they're not just that, but they are also a set of, um, you know, didactive sort of guides to behavior that yep. allow human sure. groups to flourish. <laughs> and, um, you know, John Stewart would say that before we had an evolutionary worldview, we needed to rely on a, on a supernatural entity in order to live harmoniously and cooperatively with each other, in order to um, deduce these rules and stick by them, to have an authority sufficiently powerful enough that, that you know we really care about sticking to these rules. But now that we have an evolutionary worldview, we can deduce all these rules all on our own. 
we can understand what it takes to make human society flourish. Um, and we can understand by looking at our past evolution and then by extrapolating and then by becoming vehicles for its ongoing extrapolation. And so he would say that the evolutionary worldview supersedes the need for God. Um, although I, I'm personally, as you can probably gather, um, um, a little bit more, um, well, I don't know how to say it, open to, to the spiritual side of things. Right. Right. Well, uh, the way I frame it is I believe in the concept of God. Uh, and, and what I mean is, is its capacity, even if we embrace it as a projection or uh, as part of our complexified uh, structure, it can serve as, uh, at the very least, for naturalists, an icon uh, of re that represents a particular very important function. Um, and the argument also is going to be that there, will, that for good reasons, there will be theists, um, and we want a placeholder for a whole host of different reasons uh, that may have real ontological reality <laughs> that we can be connecting to. So, um, so I would certainly, you know, I'm I'm in both camps, as it were, not in a ambiguous way, but found my own particular thread. Uh, and line. And also in relationship, I totally, so the unified theory emphasizes uh, what's called behavioral investment theory, which is basically um, your relationship of investment and return on investment with the environment. Uh, and then it creates uh, what's called the influence matrix, which is the self other investment strategies that we engage in as hominids. Um, and that was basically conforms to a behavioral economic game theory kind of structure. Um, and then as we are able to gain more and more uh, connection and synchronicity between our sub intersubjective uh, relations, somebody like uh, Thomas Sello uh, talks about the ways in which as primates we have, our, we humans, our hominid primate mind can sync up and track each other really well. Uh, the unified theory then basically puts uh, for symbolic language and then specifically propositional language uh, and then question answer dynamics. Uh, in the context of group cooperation uh, and competition. Mm. Uh, and what it argues then is that propositions and question answer dynamics give rise to what I call justification systems. Okay? Mm. Justification systems then are interlocking networks of propositions uh, that legitimize is and ought and function as the cooperative structure. Um, and then it also says, in addition to sort of deriving kind of the kinds of rules, it does give rise, the question problem gives rise to the why problem. The why problem that gives ultimately rise to, in order to have a coherent system of justification, you back up into a why problem, create a kind of a spiritual tautology usually, and then say, oh, this is the reason why. And then that becomes the guiding structure around which the uh, systemic uh, um, cultural organizations are emerged. So justification systems then become the network of propositions that link together, that navigate human cooperation and give rise to what I call the culture person plane of existence. And it seems actually, if you break it down, it's really intuitive that, like the idea that in order to, you know, I I've stolen um, the khaki fruit that is actually supposed to be shared between the whole tribe. Um, I, I can't justify that behavior unless I have a sense of self and a kind of way of like talking about myself and and like a, a self identity that I can go no 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 I, I took it and I had to for all of these reasons you see <laughs> like that actually like the idea that we kind of developed like a, the the kind of um, I mean you used a particular terminology but that kind of like self referential human level consciousness in order to justify our behavior to the group seems really kind of intuitive to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, and the argument is, is that we would be syncing up, we get symbolic, and really, although certainly there's an internal equilibrium that we need, uh, once you get also, the, it's a, it becomes the what I call the social problem, of adaptive problem of justification, is through questions and answers, the other people, if they find you with the thing <laughs> that supposedly you've stolen, you then, with question answer dynamics, unlike in other animals, I can say, why the hell is this thing here? Like, that's the why question. Um, and the interesting thing about language is that it is a complete window into the mind in a way that's totally different uh, than other animals and behaviors. That through propositions and question answers, it's a direct window. Um, you'll notice that when you have experiences, the language shit goes right through. <laughs> the feeling shit doesn't go. It's got to mediate through your body. But actually, the words, they don't lose any form when you go right through them. So it's actually, the, the argument is actually, this is an actual window into the mind through proposition. And then what happens is then from a psychological, human psychological perspective, then this is actually what drives the evolution of the ego. Okay. So the ego then is the mental organ of justification. And what it has to do is it's got to narrate the inside shit. 
which is your experiential self, and create a persona out here. And then it's the filtering dynamics between your experiential self, your ego, and your persona. Okay. Um, so that's what the problem of justification shines the light on, which is the dynamics of human consciousness in a very, very refined way. So you can take and upgrade Freud and then place him in the context of modern psychological science and organize and assimilate a huge amount of human consciousness cognition into cultural evolution in a particular kind of way. So it's a, that was one of the key insights I was able to grab. And that's, it's so similar to the way, I mean, Persick talks about it in really layman's terms, but that's so similar to the way that Persick talks about, you know, our mind evolving out of society and, right. the, you know, the, you have this social level of justifications. Um, but, and then, you know, what you also touched on is, 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 you know, that we can then spectate our ego, right? So in some important <laughs> sense, we can observe our own justifications and go, hang on, that's a load of bullshit. And that, again, frees us in some way from the kind of social influences and that, you know, from the biological to the social to the intellectual or however you want to split yeah. this up, you know, the, the, we become increasingly free of these levels of behavior. You know, totally. I am not dictated to by my biology. My biology yeah. might go... I love sugar, but I don't have to eat Mars bars all day long. In the same way, a chocolate Labrador will eat as much. Um, we, had, we, we had a chocolate Labrador when we were young, <laughs> and uh, we had a, a, a hog roast for my sister's wedding. Mm. And the guy came to pick up the like equipment afterwards mm -hmm. the next day and was like, mm -hmm. "You didn't, you didn't have to clean all of the, the, you know, the, the spit." And and we're like. We didn't clean it. <laughs> like we just saw our chocolate Labrador like on the lawn, like literally vomiting, like black bar. I mean, nearly died. Had mm. eaten like an entire, you know, pig's worth of fat, right. um, just because it doesn't have enough butter. It's like you know, I'm I'm free of that in some important way because I have a self, you know, a self-referential yep. consciousness where I can go, hang on, here's an impulse. Do I want to act on it? No. And in a similar way, but but as you say, that's embedded in society, right? That's embedded in social norms and wanting to fit in and and be with an in group. And all the sort of um, problems that come with that that we see playing out on social media, this kind of like these tribal dynamics where yep. I want to flag my membership of an in-group and, and maybe I'm completely immune to any reasonable argument from the other side because actually what I'm more interested in doing is like playing to these group dynamics and, and, and you know, representing mm -hmm. my social self in a way that's going to be beneficial to me. And so, you know, to go a level beyond that is to spectate all of that happening within yourself to go, yeah, God, I'd love to be part of this group and that's cool, but actually... I can still see the validity in someone else's argument and I'm not going to pigeonhole myself. I'm going to, my mind is somehow free of those social dynamics in a way that it wasn't before. And that, I, you know, this emerging space that you and I are so plugged into is so focused on that, right? And essentially what it is, is just, you know, an, another evolution of human consciousness. It's like, okay. I, I listened to that episode you did with Zach Stein, you know, he's talking about a meta news analysis. It's like, yep. okay, so the news is playing out according to social dynamics and social structures and in profit incentives and all the rest of it. Well, can we just spectate all of that and then get, and then basically and ultimately free ourselves from those dynamics in an important way? Um, and I think, you know, that that's the game now that we're playing as individuals and as, as a society. It's like, how much can we how much can we do that? You know, we can't ignore the way we're programmed, but with a degree of awareness, we can start to free ourselves from it and therefore be a bit more conscious about how we how we live and how we evolve individually and collectively. Amen. Amen. That's a, I think those are uh, what is coalescing right now is precisely that level of awareness, that kind of awareness where um, we now see ourselves you know, sort of adults embedded in convention, okay, justifying the shit that we were taught, right? But then there is a position, a meta position, a sage position, you don't want to elevate it in too much, but you could see animal, the child to adult, and then you were like, wait a minute, you know, there's a whole nother perspectival shifting that needs to take place. And then at the level of the individual and at the level of the culture. And then especially when you realize, oh shit, the trajectory of this thing um, needs actually a significant transformation, at least if you take, you know, a Daniel Schmachtenberger and certainly me, it's sort of like, hey, there's a civilization risk factor that's now emergent and operative that this thing's teetering on a very thin, high stack. And now all of a sudden, when you become awake of that, you're like, whoa, you know, it's like, okay, there's this conventional adult investment justification game A structure uh, that's unfolding. And really, ultimately, it's like, wait a minute, you're, you were inside it. And now you take a meta perspective. Now you shift. And now you have the conscious evolutionary awareness. And that ultimately, if we can cultivate that capacity to make that yet another lateral shift 
and then return to our systems of justification, be present with them, but recognize that this reflective narrative has got to fundamentally alter into a different direction that's much more sustainable and both and fulfilling. Um, just to get down to brass tacks here, Greg, how do you think how do you think we're doing? I mean, do you think do you think we're doing a good job of that? I mean, or, you know, I mean, because I, I, you know, like obviously we all listen to each other's podcasts and we talk about this stuff and we all feel really good about it. We pat each other on the back, but like, uh, uh, is this is this is this going quick enough? I mean, I suppose Hansi would say, um, Hansi Freinacht would say, mm -hmm. you know, we don't need you need a meta modern a modern aristocracy. You don't need everyone to really be, you know, reading Hansi sure. Freinacht and listening to Daniel Schmachtenberger, but you need a certain level up mm -hmm. there. Um, but do you think it's do you think it's going quickly enough? I mean, I, I like I say, I love that episode with Zach Stein of the Consilience Project. But I just remember thinking, God, I mean, I, I I'm struggling to like keep up with what these guys are saying here, and I'm obsessed with this stuff. Yeah. And so it's like, how 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 widely do you think this is so, going to right? Gonna... <clears throat> That's a great question. I don't, I, you know, uh, so it depends on my mood. And obviously, I I'm I'm one little creature, and and the systems, you know how many exponential uh, degrees uh, higher than I am in terms of its actual complexity. So I uh, specialize certain things, my mood will color it. Um, so I just tell people, I feel, I really do feel like the variation of what's possible is extremely high. That's my strong sense. Um, my mood and when it's negative, it's like, we're fucked. Okay. Uh, there's a, there's a felt sense that, you know, you'll in some podcasts, I'm like, well, I'm a flea on a Titanic here. <laughs> no, that's the felt set. And a couple of us are bouncing around in some little thing, but the idea that there's actually uh, the capacity of, again, enough fleas on the control center that turns the fucking ship that's already contextualized in a contingency um, that is, you know, ground in and it's defended already against a lot of this kind of stuff. People say this forever, blah, blah, blah. So there's a negative part of my cultural immune system, a cultural immune important. system and an, iner an institutional inertia. Um, so the, the flip side of me, uh, you know, I can read Steven Pinker and enlightenment now. Uh, and although I certainly don't agree with all of that, I can see a lot of positives. Um, I don't Someone know. Was recommending the hands, Ro hands Rosling factfulness. I think that's pretty much the same hymn sheet. I've heard well. of that. Yep. Uh, I've seen a number of, you know, uh, a, be very aware that there is a strong dystopian bitterness sense, okay? Uh, and then when you get availability heuristics, you got a lot of people talking in this way. You can certainly, we have so much access. Um, I, I emphasize the thing called the summer of the shark, which we had over here. Um, that's an example of availability heuristics. So what happened, I'm in the East Coast of the United States, um, some, t you know, in like South Carolina, North Carolina, whatever, um, the summer starts and this 11-year-old kid gets eaten by a shark, killed by a shark, okay? And it's just unbelievable sort of trauma, classic, you know, so all everyone comes, can't believe, and this, you know, really nice family, so they can videotape it, and everybody's like, okay, this is just archetypal horror. And once the archetypal horror gets started, and it was such a captivating story, then everybody wrote about every shark event that was happening. And then at, by, like halfway through the summer, it was like, oh my God, what the fuck is going on with all the goddamn sharks? You know, why the hell they start attacking everybody? And then at the end of the summer, somebody is like, okay, I actually do a catalog of all the shark attacks because there is a way they record them. And lo and behold, 2006 or whatever the fuck it was, it was they had fewer shark attacks in 2006 than they had in 2005. And it was the availability heuristic in the media, you know, as everybody got all this major event and then everybody had a mindset. And so everybody was just a, a consuming that. We're in very, very big danger of that. The world, like I said, is unbelievably complex. Sure, there's a lot of shit that's happening. And if everybody's mindset is, oh my God, it's a nightmare, you attend to that. And, uh, mm. and so then you become surrounded in the idea that the world's a nightmare, when in fact, in many contexts, certainly up to 2019 at lots of different scales, 2020 with the COVID, it's complicated. You know, there, it's, a, it's a mixed bag. Now, I think we're putting an enormous amount of pressure on the environment. I'm really worried about technological things like CRISPR in terms of bioengineering weaponry. I'm all, obviously, we have nuclear weapons. Um, so, for me, the issue is this. Uh, there's both a huge amount of progress and a huge amount of threat, okay? Uh, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty and nobody knows. Um, uh, there are certainly, uh, how do I think we're doing? Listen, I, if the world is literally on a time frame to get global civilization collapsed by the end of this decade, then we're fucked. There's no way we're moving that fast. I mean, there's no way you can change the infrastructure that quickly. 
If, however, there is an actual ch chance, you know, that the system, and I actually, I certainly believe this would be the case, that the whole thing's not going to collapse by, say, 2050, um, do you see an emerging wave that is building an enormous amount of potential for a massive high level transformation of being so that by 2050, by the time my kids are having kids um, and, you know, and they're living their lives, do we see a spreading of that? So the back half of the 21st century has an awakening of conscious evolution uh, that, and that that generation starts to, um, you know, settle into the digital uh, fifth joint point, what I call fifth joint point, metacultural space in a new kind of way that's much more harmonized with each other, technology, natural world, and sustainable in a particular way that overcomes some of the meaning and mental health crises that we have and engenders the power that we have, but defeated in a way that nourishes our souls and spirits. I, I, I you know, I absolutely, I think that there is with it that's within the realm of the believable and possible. Um, and, and I think that I, you know, I obviously the COVID has caused a lot of horror at one level, but one of the things that's happened certainly to me is more and more people are like waking up. Okay. There's this, there's this urge and this dawning, you know, of awakening. That's like, you know, this old system is not sufficient. There's something fucking wrong with what it is that we did, you know, and there's then a longing for something potentially new. So I see the system, which as a psychotherapist, by the way, in order to get actual people to change, you have to first have the system get hurt and the dawning on whether or not this is actually, am I in a good place? Maybe I could be in a better place. So I, what I'm seeing in the last, and this is different than it was 10 years ago, definitely. Um, the, the sense of fuck maybe we need a totally different operating system has spread through the culture in the last 10 years and radically different. I'm, and this is my own little life, but I've been now catapulted. So I'm now around people, a whole culture of people who are seeing this from different angles. And I am amazed at how much, how similar it is. And if then you could thread this together so that there is coherence between the various seers that are seeing shit, and there is a way to uh, diagnose the errors. This is something I try to bring with a lot of analytic precision. Like there's a fucking problem with psychology that I know how to fix. And that's a big part of this goddamn confusion structure as to why we're empty at our soul level and how we rotate it to fill it. If I can hook up with Zach and John Verbeke and blah, 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 and there's a movement uh, of seers around what kind of conscious evolution that can be talked to people in a particular way, this decade can see a transformation. I really believe that um, of a subset mm -hmm. of individuals that could then translate into genuine change in the next decade. And then those kids can mm -hmm. raise their kids so that the next decade has actually people being socialized, a substantive portion of the population being socialized into particular kinds of worldviews that then have a radical change down the road. So uh, for me, it's a 30 year, I mean, you know, I turned 80 in, 19, in 2050 <laughs> and that's, you know, uh, 70 in 2000, uh, 80 in 2050 and sort of like, okay, that's the arc that I'm seeing as a 30 year arc of transformation. And, mm. um, uh, you know, I, Again, it depends on whether or not I'm optimistic and to really see that as really feasible. And when I say that, it's like, oh my God, look at all the good stuff going on. And then obviously pessimism, no, the thing's going to get, so we're fleas on the Titanic. It's going to hit the iceberg and it's already done. <laughs> so there you go. That's my little structure. Yeah. I, and I think ultimately it's very important to be aware that both are possible. I mean, um, thinking that everything's totally doomed and there's nothing we can do about it is obviously not very good. Um, and not very conducive to like the effort and energy that we need to pull through this. But equally thinking, oh, it's all going to be fine and technology will solve everything is kind of equally blind and ignorant. So I think it's important to realize that what we do really does matter and could tip this either way. Oh. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm as excited as you are about that emerging space of seers, as you call them, who, who seem to have their finger really on the button of what is going on. Um, and I just like, I humbly offer myself as basically a communicator of those ideas to people who probably wouldn't tune into this podcast normally or who wouldn't um you know listen to daniel schmachtenberger or who wouldn't um watch you know awakening from the meaning crisis you yep. know, essentially what i'm trying to do is to digest all of that rich rich insightful content and make it um digestible for people who perhaps wouldn't normally tap into that um, so that's like, that's what I'm trying to do. Totally, um, which is, is essential to the whole part of the, obviously there's a, from my vantage point, there's, yeah, there's, 
um, you know, there's a, there are a lot of really intense, high level intellectual questions that are, at, you know, that do play a role in this. And then at the same time, there's the consolidation and getting an, a reasonable, optimal grip to use John Verveke on the gist of what the hell this is. And then you translate that gist into something that has real world impact in people's lives. And, and that that fundamentally is absolutely essential if this is going to have a difference. Yeah, I think Hansi Freinach called it scaffolding. You know, yep. you like you, you actually like scaffold people up to these levels of development through language almost. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like it's not that they necessarily have the cognitive complexity to have, you know, to, to listen to the conversation between you and Zach Stein. It's just that you can you can use language to scaffold them up to a level where they're there, they're basically acting in coherence with that way of looking at things, okay. even if they, you know, they're not gonna read all the books. Mm -hmm. um, You're right. And, and the whole point that you make about conscious evolution and meaning, that's why I loved your podcast. I, I thought it was, um, you know, was afforded a lot of people contact with it. You know, again, you'd have to be somewhat refined and you have to be thinking about these issues in a particular way to be so receptive. Uh, but it seemed to me to be well placed uh, for a substantive portion of the population. Yeah. And it's beautiful because, I mean, if I'm right, right, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> But like, you know, everyone knows what's meaningful to, to them. You don't have to, you don't have to like go and do, you know, listen to our podcast series to know what's meaningful to you. It's like, we, we, and if you don't, it's just because you've forgotten. You know, I meet people at dinner parties all the time and I'm like, well, what do you find meaningful? When I was researching this podcast, I used to ask people that all the time. And a lot of people would be like, oh, I don't know. And then you'd be like, okay, well, what did you find meaningful when you were 12? And they were like, oh, dancing. You know, mm -hmm. so and it's not to say that they they're supposed to be a dancer. It's just to say that that they've lost the trail of breadcrumbs. You know, and totally. when you pursue what you find meaningful, it's not like this is an answer that you stumble across. And it's like, oh, I got it. I find my evolutionary purpose. It's like, <laughs> no, you get led on a breadcrumb trail, and one thing leads to another, and one thing leads to another, and then you're you're constantly discovering things that are meaningful to you, and 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 totally. you know, you pursue them throughout your whole life. And that I think you know that's beautiful because everyone gets that. That's not an intellectual thing to nope. ask someone to do. In fact, it tends to be people who have intellectualized themselves or been educated out of following what they find totally. meaningful that struggle with this kind of question. You know, um, it's like it, it's it, it's there's a yeah exactly that we've almost been like educated out of it, um, and and that's accessible to everyone. You know, everyone finds something meaningful, um, and that's why I think it's like a good way of. Yeah, sort of translating these concepts down in a way that everyone really will will get. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to get your sense. Also, you asked me kind of what am I, how how do I feel like we're doing? Um, I'd like to, you know, I was definitely plan on asking you how to, how are we doing? How have we been doing? What do we need to be doing differently? Um, what's your sense? I, I like to, you know, I'm as you may have said, you know, I'm deep into the arcane academic shit. <laughs> this, okay. So, so, you know, and then pulled this, um, uh, analysis this really, uh, for me, beautiful and meaningful, but almost everybody else is like, what the fuck are you doing? You know, it's like, yeah, <laughs> this thing is multi-layered complex. I try to listen to you for a little while. And it's like, my head's all blah, blah, blah. And fuck it. You know? So it's like, <laughs> uh, and it's like, I get that. I mean, that's necessary, but I'm really then curious as to what your sense is. Well, how is this community or other communities? What's going on? What do we need to be doing? Where are you in relationship to this whole process and, and what, what you think should be happening? Any number of those questions. Yeah, well, as I say, I mean, I see my role or relationship to it as, yeah, like a, almost like, um, I don't know, like almost somebody who makes like a, like who's that guy? Um, BBC, he makes all these really beautiful documentaries, Adam Curtis. And, you know, he takes all the, he digests all this knowledge and then he weaves it into a nice story that you can follow. So it's like, essentially, that's what I, that's how I see my relationship to it all. Mm -hmm. How do I think we're doing? Pass. <laughs> I mean, just like you, I think like collapse and transformation are both possible and probably both happening at the same time. That's not an either or. I think also, I think within the next 10, 15 years, and now I'm drawing on the work of a think tank called Rethink X. Mm. I think we are going, some technologies are going to come down the pipeline and into kind of economic like reality mm. that are, that in themselves necessitate a transformation of society. That they, they basically unpick the logic that society is built on, i.e. a logic of scarcity. And
And therefore, that will do two things. One, it will hasten the sort of collapse of like our current operating mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. Two, it makes possible a new operating system. But three, it also changes human consciousness and culture because, mm -hmm. um, you know, suddenly the, the, the basis for society is transformed and we will have to sort of evolve in order to um, fit in with that. Um, but of course, there's no guarantees, right? You know, every civilization throughout history has collapsed until this one. Um, but th th that's really interesting, the work of that totally. think tank. Yeah. Rethinking yep. I've read, I've read uh, I, not word for word their manifesto, but I've read through uh, it quite a bit. Can you say a little bit? Uh, yes, I, I really thought it was a fascinating analysis and it spoke to me in relationship to how we might rethink our relationship to resources um, and, and our position in terms of the way, you know, we generate you know, capital labor relations and productivity and consumption and how we might rethink that differently. Yeah, I mean, he, he, they, he, they basically say that the five sectors are going to undergo a 10x transformation in the next 10 years. I mean, maybe 15, 20. And, and also, these might be optimistic, these timescales. But regardless, they're coming at some point. And one of them is like um, is transport. So basically, within and this, is, this will happen within 10 years. We'll have electric driverless Ubers within 10 years everywhere, pretty much. So at that point, there's no economic, there's no incentive to own a car. Why would I own a car when for a fraction of the price I can get wherever I want and I could be pissed as well if I want to be, <laughs> right? I don't have to drive this thing. I don't have to get a license. I don't have to pay tax. Way easier. Okay, so that, that means that suddenly, what does that do? Well, suddenly the, the automotive industry is completely transformed. You don't need car parks anymore. Think of the vast tracts of land that could be freed up for growing trees or whatever. Um roads wouldn't need to be as big because there'd be a fraction of the cars on the road, right? Because you'd have two, three people sharing a lift, you know, who knows? Um, that's one. Food is another. So we've got precision fermentation technologies, which basically means that, you know, you can grow uh, animal protein or whatever you want, palm oil, um, in the lab uh, out of bacteria at virtually zero environmental cost, well, a fraction of the environmental cost. So suddenly you don't need land for agriculture anymore. So you get vast tracts of land freed up for rewilding um, and all the kind of knock-on benefits that having, you know, large mammals roaming over the plains and what they do to the soil and all the rest of it will, will suddenly do. Um, you won't need to, you know, cut down trees for palm oil, etc. Um, information is kind of already happening, right? Like the information revolution is basically, it's, it's, you know, it's, we're still, the dust is still settling from that one. And often it's the information that comes first, right? You know, the yep. printing press yep. kick-started uh, sort of modern industrialization in much the same way the internet is making possible all of these conversations and ways of totally. thinking about things. That was kind of already happened. Um, energy, so we'll basically have... Um, you know, solar panels and batteries that are good enough that will all, you know, renewable energy will be generated and stored locally. You won't have like a massive grid. It'll be coming from, you know, maybe a load of solar panels on your roof or just down the road. Um, and the batteries will be good enough to store that. So you won't have this kind of like need to like prop up the energy grid with gas or whatever it is. Um, and, and, and the fifth one is material. So, you know, the, the argument people throw against that is like, oh, we'll have to mine all the rare earth materials to make these solar panels. It's like, well, yeah, eventually we'll be able to build these things from the molecular structure upwards. We'll be able to build the materials we need from the molecular structure upwards. So, so those five changes, if within the next 10 years, you know, or 15 years they arrive, and crucially, we can let go of our obsolete ideologies that are holding us from basically taking, you know, benefiting from these things. That we can, our operating system can adapt fast enough that entrenched power systems, you know, power dynamics don't yep. basically um, delay the rollout and the delay the spread of these technologies. And just basically, we're just quick enough to evolve with all these things coming. Then I think, yes, a radically different, um, basically post scarcity world. He calls it like um, abundance, the world, you know, world of abundance. <laughs> Um, is absolutely possible. But, you know, you can see this, these things going in, in another direction, right? You can see um, all the kind of like entrenched power structures basically just like fighting these things off with a barge pole, um, the regulations not catching up fast enough, um, you know, our, 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 but also our ideologies and mindsets not catching up fast enough. And because also there is a scary side to all this technological stuff, right? Totally. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not out of spite and malice that organic farming 
advocates delayed the rollout of golden rice mm. in India and mm. Indonesia and, and left, you know, millions of children blind. You know, mm. that wasn't because they were nasty people. Mm. It was because they they didn't have the right information or they were, you know, they they, they had an obsolete way of looking at things or, or not, perhaps a not sufficiently nuanced way of looking at things. Mm. And it's the same with all this stuff. It's like, you know, there's a very real, very real danger of throwing out the baby with the bathwater, that because all these technologies are scary and they challenge a lot of our, again, evolved value and moral systems that say, don't think, don't play God, don't tinker with all this stuff, you know, that, that maybe we won't adapt quick enough to allow these things to take hold quick enough. And that therefore, you know, we're facing, um, you know, ecological collapse, mass extinction, all the rest of it. Yeah, I really am glad you brought up uh, Rethink X. Uh, that, that is... Uh, on the technical technological side, so <clears throat> I kind of, uh, from a you talk perspective, this tree of knowledge perspective, um, we really see this uh, identify this as sort of the fifth joint point, um, and the fifth joint point uh, at a sort of concrete way is the the digital world, and and the reason is because underneath uh, life is the emergence of RNA, DNA, and cell to cell communication, and mind is the nervous system, uh, the animal mind, uh, nervous system, and then behavior and animal communication, and then culture, person is justification and talking, um, and the argument is each information processing system and c- communication system is really fundamentally shifts. Uh, a qualitative new dimension of existence or plane of existence. Um, and then if you look the lens at the world through that, then you see uh, partial shifts in information like the printing press, like writing, like money, but the digital is really sort of like a qualitatively different kind of, uh, because we get artificial computing that we interface with, we get the network of, uh, you know, laid down throughout the thing. We interface with this across a wide variety of different things. So anyway, the argument is that, hey, the entire infrastructure is changing. So there's going to be this massive potential for transformation, but then that creates all sorts of complexity, chaos dynamics too, okay? Because the old structure is going to then have to go through either an effective evolution or it's going to be threatened. It's going to shut down. You're going to break down out of chaos. Um, so that's the general structure. And then the question is, well, how do we make the transition? And I argue, you know, we have a technological environmental problem. Uh, We have this digital globalization problem. Uh, And the Rethink X guys are doing really nice, uh, at least hopeful, uh, visionary work in relationship to that. Um, And you need that, right? Like you need that chink. If you're at the bottom of a dark cave, you need something to aim towards, you know, even if you're not going to make it there. I think that's what humanity desperately needs right now is just like a vision of where we could go to inspire people to say, you know, don't give up that actually there is hope and that you, and that we need you. We actually, Mm -hmm. you know, every single one of us is going to be important in this. And that kind of like, not blind optimism, but just hope is so important to us right now. You know, there's so much bad news and there's, there's nothing that, and, and as you say, often because of these like availability heuristics and sort of psychological mechanisms that make us over-focus on the bad news. Um, but I think there's nothing worse for change efforts right now than this view that humans are somehow all selfish, evil bastards. Oh, and yeah. that actually, you know, and that, and that basically, you know, we're, we're all terrible and we're all horrible to each other and, you know, I mean, listen, like, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have blindfold on, but we do overlook the extraordinary evolutionary achievement that it even is to sit here and have this conversation. It's amazing. And, and to drink, um, you know, ancient Chinese tea, you know, that I'm drinking right now. And, um, you know, I'm sorry about the kettle, by the way, that's what that noise is. <laughs> um, you know, and, and just like, just the, just the sort of incredible goodness of people on a day-to-day basis. Like, you know, just the simple fact that we aren't tearing each other apart in, in the metro carriage is an achievement, you know? 100%. And then not to mention all the extraordinary expressions of human creativity, the unbelievable, you know, we, we give as a species, it's quite normal to donate money to someone that you've never met before. You know, Absolutely. how incredible is that? You're giving money a- to a charity on the other side of the world. That's unreal evolutionary achievement. I've never met this person. I'm not going to benefit from this. I'm probably not even telling anyone about it, you know? And like that is that is an unbelievable thing that that, that, that humans humans have within us. And, you know, I mean, I could go on and on. I, I'm, I'm just like a massive fan 
of humanity. And I think we need to discover our love of ourselves as a species, not like in a kind of forgiving all the terrible stuff that we're doing, but just like cut ourselves some slack. Do you know what I mean? Like we, we have come a long fucking way. And like, you know, the, the, we, we, we are still badly programmed in lots of ways. And we, 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 we do still um, gorge on the fruits of the planet in an unsustainable way and do horrible things to animals. And I'm really not overlooking all of that. It's just that I think, you know, and you would know this as a psychologist, like if someone's got some bad habits and bad habits and um, bad patterns of behavior and they're trying to change them, you don't get them to change by going, your bloody terrible useless little worm <laughs> and like go back and do it again. You know, that's not how therapy works, is it? You have to teach them to love themselves first. Right. Yeah, and I think as a species, we really, really have to do that. Like, even though we're flawed. I love that. No, no. And certainly um, I think people, right. I think the modern sensibility um, has created such this contingent instrumentalism, uh, this sort of physical reductionism. Uh, we have failed uh, to appreciate our hearts and how um, unbelievably pro-social our potential is. Uh, there are a lot of uh, layers to see this if you know how to look for it, uh, but it gets way too often, uh, you know, sort of drowned out by other uh, notions of self-interest and just we're mechanistic and blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a really, there's a beautiful book called The Battle of Human for Human Nature uh, by Barry Schwartz that does this back in 1986. There are more recent books on humanity uh, that speak to this. I am a, uh, definitely, I love humanity. Uh, and, and I think we're all, I think we're really exceptional. We're really a unique uh, species. I'm very, um, you know, attuned to some of the damage, that, of course, that we're doing to Mother Earth, some of the horrible things we do to other mammals, in particular, perhaps uh, birds, um, and that's brutal. Um, and we certainly do, shouldn't let ourselves off the hook for all the horrible things we've done to other people um, in that re regard. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, our capacity for cooperation, our capacity for love, our capacity for transcendence um, is uh, unique and beautiful in relation. Uh, and to me, if that's not something to honor, to protect, to feel good about, I don't know what would be. Uh, and I think we have to figure out uh, that sentiment needs to be one of the things that I do hear about the, in the current, you know, sort of negativity is this, is this um, loss of how much beauty and goodness there really is. Mm. And I'm really glad that you said the word pro-social there, because that's something we really need to nurture. Um, I took a course with prosocial.world, which is basically using um, Eleanor Ostrom's eight core design principles, along with David Sloan Wilson, who's an evolutionary ah, biologist, who said uh -huh. these eight core design principles apply across all levels of evolution. And almost using that as a set of tools to basically, yeah, to wisely manage our own evolutionary processes, in his own word, to basically say, hang on, we know how to get cooperation to work within groups and between groups there's actually these principles and we can we can actually apply them you know and you can do that with a school or a company or, or groups of schools even up to the global level so it's like we do have these tools we just need to apply them really consciously i mean another project that i'm working on at the moment which i find really exciting is basically it's a it's a sort of conscious currency it's called beach it's basically um it's a, it's a cryptocurrency where 1.5 or soon to be two percent of every transaction goes towards the planet um, and it's got this very, very clever tokenomics that means it can be a means of exchange as well. It's stable enough for that. And it's also um, it's also um, likely to accrue reflections and it's deflationary as well. So it actually makes it quite an attractive investment. But the key thing is that every single transaction is going towards funding the planet. Wow. You know, and that, that, mm -hmm. that the way we've designed our currency so far to be built on debt and interest is totally unsustainable. Mm -hmm. But until we have the consciousness to do that, the awareness of where we're going and the awareness that money is this thing that we can design, you know, then, then you know, th that wasn't an option. And suddenly the crypto space has basically just blown apart this idea. Money was like the water that we swam in. You know, no one looked at it and said, hang on, how is this designed? And is it serving us or, or, or not? You know, and suddenly we can, we can do that. Um, and the digital, the whole digital, you know, expansion has, has facilitated that kind of ability to look at these things and then sort of play around with them. And Beach is basically an attempt to do that, to, to, to make a planet positive money that, that actually is conducive to evolutionary flourishing. Love that. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, that re uh, relates, I, I built this thing called the iQuad coin, uh, which <laughs> is about cultivating human currency. Uh, on the backside is that tree of life, that thing behind me. 
Um, and essentially awesome. what it is, is it's a symbol of the current currency of humanity, uh, the human identity function, and the process by which we can then, um, it's got all the symbolism in it, but basically how do we connect our some, uh, our subjective conscious experience of being uh, to cultivate awareness, and then it connects it first to mathematics, and then it connects it to the world around us in a particular type of way. And this side then connects from each of us, and then to build a webbed network into wisdom philosophies. Um, and then, so then, then we're creating reciprocal currents and currencies uh, to, you know, create that collective shared wisdom energy, I call it. So it's a currency for wisdom energy. Um, so there's a, another that. way of thinking about, you know, our, what money actually is and what it might be in terms of how we might uh, cultivate different kinds of exchanges that are really healthily generative. I was given um, some perception dollars once, which is basically a kind of like tweaked US dollar, but the denomination was four. And it had like all of these like cool organizations and like really beautiful quotes about human potential on the back of it and stuff. I used to go around uh, music festivals and give them people to out who just like had some good Jedi mind tricks or just some nice little skillful means. And I'd just be like, boom, there's four perception dollars. Thank you for your, <laughs> thank you for your Beautiful. wisdom. Yeah. And, and totally um, blow people's minds. They got really excited about it. It was really fun. Love it. Yeah. That's it. In fact, this is, um, I've talked to a couple other people. Maybe they'll develop their own kind of object, you know, of the symbolism and that we can then exchange them, you know, in terms of the creative process and say, hey, you know, here, you give me some conscious evolutionary butterfly, which I saw in your thing, you know, is, okay, how are we going to metamorphosize into a conscious awakening? It's like, well, here, how do we cultivate a sense of currency between us? And then how do we weave these together in synergistic and positive ways? That's the, if we are able to unlock those kinds of potentials, which I, that's when I get excited and hopeful and, you know, and maybe we can turn a corner here in a way that's really uh, very foundational shift that titanic <laughs> and the symbolism is really important right um i mean uh, i was sort of part of the extinction rebellion movement in the, mm. the sort of second wave in particular and i know it's um controversial and has definitely had its issues but the sort of symbolism of that was so potent the hourglass mm -hmm. symbol with the you know the with the circle oh. around yeah. it you know, it was just like so grabbed people's attention. There was just a while, a while when they were just everywhere on the London Underground. You couldn't go anywhere without them. And I think that, like, you know, that, that there's there's actually a marketing element to all of this, right? Like, yeah. it's not just about these high-level conversations. Somehow we have to make it kind of appealing and cool, like the metamodernists do, you know? Like, it's all about cultural capital. Um, right, and that's, a, that's, that's one that's of the things. That's why I wear waistcoats. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, uh, that's, a, that's one of the things that really interests me, and that's why I need to make connections. That's not, I'm a theorist. I'm not really, I don't understand marketing. Um, there's structures in me. I, there's there's a, a joy of sharing and a trying to connect, and there's visions for it, but then there are other perspectives that need to be merged with it so that the system can actually evolve into the kind of thing that has the actual difference. So uh, I generate all this sort of psychotechnology, John Berbeke's words, and then it's sort of like, yes, well, how will that be actually metabolized? And then I'm sharing it with people. And actually, I have a lot of people working on you talk in various facets um, that then are trying to say, hey, how can I make my uh, this relatable to me, and we're going to be exploring those kinds of issues, which then afford, I think, the the way to digest the message and to see where it will resonate people in their own world and their own development and their own lives, things along those lines. Mm. Yeah, well, that's a very important project. I wish you all the best with it, Craig. Mm. I think I'm coming to the end of my yep. um, sort of mental capabilities. Uh, then um, I was just about ready to wrap us up and see if uh, the, uh, if there's anything else that you wanted to share, any uh, things that you're involved in now or future horizons or uh, anything you want to link to in the show notes that folks can leave you with in terms of uh, as you recall this conversation or follow up on. Um, well, yeah, apart, apart from Conscious Evolution in the podcast, which, you know, I'd love um, people to listen to, um, definitely also Beach Token, um, this mm -hmm. Conscious Currency I talked about, beachtoken.io. Okay. I think that's basically the best and most interesting designed currency I've ever come across mm -hmm. um, and has real potential. Um, yeah, prosocial.world as well. They were very kind to, um, uh, you know, give me a, a, a crash course in how they do things. And I think, honestly, that's a very, very valuable and, and it's very scientifically grounded as well in the way that some, you know, it's, it's just like very rigorous and very thoughtful, um, about how to create more harmony in the world. Um, so those would be my three. Great. Point. Maybe we'll do uh, Rethink X also. We'll put a little link in there in that plan. Absolutely. Maybe Rethink X. Yeah. Rethinking Humanity is that book. Yep. It's really good. Right, right, right. Beautiful. 
All right, friend. Well, uh, I want you to know uh, that conscious evolution was a real lodestar. I was already in that space, but I, I found it. I thought the way you did it. Uh, and I think that what you're contributing is really uh, outstanding. And I really appreciate your work in this effort. It's really nice to sync up. Well, thank you so much, Greg. That's really music to my ears. I appreciate it. And you too. All righty. Take care. Thanks so much. All right.